know about you guys, but for me, this Christian walk can sometimes feel like uh, uh, like we're getting to know God. Do you ever feel like, man, I, I feel like I'm learning more about the Lord each and every day. Maybe in your devotion time, maybe in prayer, maybe even in worship. You find like, you find yourself in a relationship with God where you're continuing to get to know Him, right? And as we've looked at the book of Deuteronomy, and we understand that Moses is basically leaving some final instructions for this second generation of Israelites, and I think one of the things that he so desires to convey, I think one of the things that the Lord so desires to convey through him, is who God is. You're going into a promised land. I'm leaving you instructions on how you're to serve God and how you're to worship God, how you're to glorify God in your lives. And and so it's so important for us, as it is for the nation of Israel here, to understand that, that God wants us to get to know Him in the process. He's not asking simply that they would just follow along blindly what it was that this last generation of people did. No, what he's asking is that they would get to know him. And as they get to know him, that they would find themselves in the process of, uh, of falling in love with God and understanding his character and understanding why it is he wishes them to walk a certain way, to look a certain way, to act a certain way. And I think that very truth applies to us today. Because I don't know about you guys, but I have a tendency to have the wrong ideas about people on a regular basis. You guys ever had the wrong idea about somebody? Maybe in a good way, right? Maybe you, you really dislike somebody or you just like how they came across, you know? It's commonplace for us New Yorkers. Sometimes we come across the wrong way sometimes. We're a little abrupt, okay? That southern charm and southern hospitality is not something that's ingrained into our northern DNA, if you will, right? But at the same time, you, you get to know somebody, and maybe you're like, you know what, but, but they love truth, man. They just hold to truth. And, and even if it sometimes rubs somebody the wrong way, they're going to hold to truth, right? It could also go the other way, right? Where maybe you had the, this, this great idea about somebody. You thought, man, this, this person likes me. I like them. And then you come to find out they're talking trash about you behind your back. Maybe it was a friend of yours. And then you come, come to find out, like, and this person was saying awful things about me. Or maybe you were down at the, uh, at the store and you had a salesperson that you felt like was really invested in you and they really liked you and they were looking out for you. And then you find out, man, they overcharged you by a whole bunch of money. It's like, man, I thought I was getting a good deal. And then I come to find out they, they didn't have my best interests in mind. I've learned that sometimes, because we can be such poor judges of character, right, the kind of character that God sees is on the inside, we can also have a tendency to misjudge the Lord, right? We hear something like the commandments, and we think, oh, he just wants, it. He just wants to let us know who's boss. He just wants to show us who's in charge. He just wants to, he just wants to make life a little bit more difficult for me. It doesn't have to be. You know, why instead of 10, couldn't he narrow it down to just a few? Actually, he narrowed it down to two, all right? And even that's too much for us at times, is it not? 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7 says this, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. This is speaking of one of David's brothers, who Samuel thought. This is the prophet Samuel, right? I mean, he was communicating with God. He had conversations with the Lord, and even he got it wrong from time to time. God says, you're looking at the outward appearance, his physical stature, because I've refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. This can be such a comforting truth. This could also be a very scary truth if we're not careful, right? Because what that means is it doesn't matter what kind of show we might put on. It doesn't matter how we behave or speak when we're at church or around pastor or around other people in the church. What God sees is something that nobody else sees. He sees what's really going on on the inside. He sees the condition of our heart. He sees whether or not we truly know him or we do not. That's why the Lord's able to say to people on the last day, he says, when they come to him, they'll say, Lord, Lord, have we not cast out demons? They knew his name. They did things for him. And he says, depart from me. I never knew you. These were people that said all the right things, did all the right things. But to God, their heart was far from him. Do we know God as well as we think we do? That's the question. You see, this second generation wasn't new to the idea of God. 
but perhaps they didn't understand him quite as well as they had been instructed to or thought they had been instructed to. Let's take a look, if you will, at verse 6, and let's look at a couple of aspects uh, or, or, or some insight that God wants to give us about himself. Starting off verse 6, it says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water underneath the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to, those, to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. As the Lord your God commanded you, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, nor, nor, I'm sorry, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you, that your days may be long and that it may be well with you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. These words the Lord spoke to all your assembly in the mountain, from the midst of the fire, the cloud, and the thick darkness, with a loud voice, and he added no more. And he wrote on them two tablets, or he wrote them on two tablets of stone, and gave them to me. If you're taking note here this evening, I can encourage you to write this down, please, that one of the things that the Lord wants us to know about him is his character. In fact, he's giving us insight into his character. His perfect law represents his perfect character. Remember, we talked about this last week. We looked at that psalm, which says, the law of the Lord is what? It's perfect. What makes the law perfect? Well, its author makes it perfect, but also it's a reflection of the character of God. God's character holds no flaws. There's no issues with God's character. There's no issue with, with God's uh, preferences. There's no issues with God's behavior. God is perfect all the way through. And therefore, when he gives us his law, what he is giving to us is much more than some arbitrary writings. He is giving to us his character. He's saying, here are the things that I like and here are the things I dislike. And, and if you like me, I want you to get to know me through these things. That's why Jesus would say, those who love me do what? Keep his commands, right? It, it, it's not a matter of prove your love to me. No, no, no. It's the same way my wife lets me know the things that she likes and the things that she dislikes. My wife knows I don't like seafood. It would be very unkind of my wife on a regular basis, on every dinner, to make me fish. You know why? Because I don't like it. Because she loves me, and here's the crazy thing, she's a huge fish fan. She loves her some fish. All right? I'm not a big pork fan. She loves her, her some pork chops and stuff. like Me? Not so much. But she looks out for her husband because she loves her husband, because she wants to bless her husband, because she doesn't want to do something that's going to hurt him in the process or, you know, chase him out of the house because of the smell. God shares with us his character. James chapter 1 verse 25 says this, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty. Now that's something interesting. It says here that God's law is a law of liberty. It's the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. In other words, God says, listen, I want to set free my blessings upon your life. 
upon your family, upon your workplace, upon your ministry. And here's how that's going to happen. When you walk in accordance with my commandments, because you love me, not because you feel a necessity to earn salvation through them, because that's not going to happen, but because you love me and you obey my commandments, you are set free. People have this understanding that somehow the law constricts and constrains. The Bible says it does the exact opposite. The Bible says that we're slaves to sin. When we walk in disobedience, we are a slave to that sin. God says, I want to set you free from that. I want you to be able to walk in liberty. It's a, it's a freeing thing, not a constraining thing. If you look with me first, at his first commandment, verse 6, it says, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Again, God reiterates here first that it was he who was the one that set this people free. He wanted to remind them of it. In fact, he thought that was an important point to start off with. When we ask ourselves, you know, oh, what's my motivation? What is it that, that kind of drives this, this need to obey the Lord? One of the first things that we should remember or should come to mind is that you were a slave, I was a slave to sin, and God set us free. We were in bondage to sin, and because we were in bondage to sin, he came into the situation, he set us free from sin through his death on the cross, and that's why God can say, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Verse 7, you shall have no other gods before me. Because what God wants us to understand is that he doesn't want us chasing dead ends. Any other pursuit, any their loyalty to any other God or the idea of God or the idea of no God is a, is a pursuit to a dead end. There was this 90s song that some of y'all might remember. It was from a group called TLC, all right? Well, oh, you guys got it. Don't go what? Chasing waterfalls. The idea of chasing a waterfall was to chase something that was intangible. It wasn't going to provide. It wasn't going to do what it was that you hoped it would do, right? It's like trying to grasp at air or to grasp at water. It's like, good luck. You're just going to frustrate yourself. It is a complete and utter waste of time. God says, if we establish or set up, even within our hearts, any other gods or anything that takes precedence over God, right? Inadvertently creating a God for ourselves, or make a God out of our workplace, or make a God out of our spouse, or make a God out of our career, whatever it is, right? If we do that, that is a giant waste of time. And in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10 through 12, he says, You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servants whom I've chosen that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, please note this, before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. I, even I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. I have declared and saved, I have proclaimed, and there was no foreign God among you. Therefore, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. Not only does this area of scripture completely dispel the idea that Jesus is somehow a lesser God because he is in fact our savior. God is making it clear here that he is the only savior, right? But, but it, it also makes very clear here that there's no other God or there's no other entity that's even on par with the Lord. They don't exist. They were never formed. They're not real. They're figments of our imagination if we ever put our hope or our time in them. The Bible makes an exclusive claim to salvation, and it is super important that we understand that. There is only one way to heaven. Jesus made it very clear. He said, there is one way to the Father, and that is by me, right? He made it abundantly clear. You can't put your hope in another God or in another belief system or another religion. All roads don't lead to the same place, unless that is hell, okay, apart from Christ, all right? Jesus made it abundantly clear that the gospel message is exclusive. It's exclusive for those who put their faith in him. There is only one way. And in fact, it's not even absurd because the idea that there could be multiple religions or multiple gods that somehow represent the one true God, the ideas even presented in those other religions are exclusive of one another. They contradict each other. 
They can't all be right. It, it, it's by sheer logic that that's made clear. And God reiterates that. He, he puts a stamp on it here in Isaiah 43, 10 through 12 by saying there is nobody else. And if you put your hope in anybody else, you're putting your hope in a wasted time or in a dead end. Secondly, verse 8, he says, You shall not make yourself a carved image in the likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the Father upon the children to the third and fourth generations Excuse me, of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. If you're taking note, please note this down. Number two, God cannot and will not be recasted. All right, God's saying, listen, we talked about this even a week ago, or I'm sorry, a couple weeks ago, where we talked about the, the sin of idolatry, right? And how God didn't want our eyes fixed upon anything else because th there was no image that would ever do him justice. But now we take it a step further, and we have to understand that in our attempt, right, to form God into what we desire him to be, okay, we, we make a silly recasting. You guys remember some shows some of y'all might have enjoyed back in the day? You remember watching your show, and then one day you turn it on, and one of the characters who you've been maybe watching for years, or you might have been watching for a while, had been recasted, right? But they just kind of did it like as if nobody was going to notice, and they look completely different. I was a huge Fresh Prince of Bel-Air fan, all right? Huge! I used to watch that show every single day. I remember you can come home from school, you watch it, you, they have the reruns. Then one day, somebody made the decision... They were going to recast Aunt Viv. And she did not look anything like the Aunt Viv. Like, they didn't even try, I felt like. I was like, really? Y'all didn't even try that hard. I was even disappointed. I remember watching, you guys saw The Incredible Hulk. Edward Norton, okay? That was in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. That was the one we all enjoy. We're all watching all the Avengers movie, all right? He was the Hulk. Then one movie, all of a sudden, it's Mark Ruffalo. They don't look anything alike. They're not even the same height. Like, what happened here? Not even the shit, same color hair. Like, what's going on? Why would they think that that would pass? The question that we have to ask ourselves, too, is when we make a God in our image or in our likeness or according to what we desire, why do we think that that will somehow pass before the Lord? That God would be okay with that. It does him no justice. In fact, it's only an insult. The Bible makes clear that images are lies. And according to God's word, he says that he must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. You cannot use or you cannot create idols, especially and especially in worship, because God says, hey, listen, if you want to worship me, if you want to draw close to me, if you want to understand who I am, okay, you don't do it according to your preference, according to your likeness. You do it according to how I I actually am according to my word. You worship me in spirit and in truth. My wife will tell you I am no fan of music or Christian music or, 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 or worship music, okay, and I use that term lightly, that conveys bad theology. John chapter 4, verse 24, again, says, God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, okay? Bad songs, songs that don't convey the character of God according to the scripture, conveys bad theology. And God is not okay with it. We can't think just because we put a Christian stamp on something, or because we say something that sounds Christianese in nature, that, that somehow God's going to be okay with it. God helps those who help themselves. Not according to the Bible that I read. Yeah, but I said God, and I said help, and that's in the Bible, isn't it? No. A bad idea or, or a misrepresentation of who God is leads people to possess or hold to a bad theology. And here's what God says according to his word. When it comes to idolatry, number one, it's a waste. It's a waste. First Peter chapter 4, verse 3 says this, For we have... For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, lust, 
drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Understand what Peter is saying here. We have spent enough of our past life. We have wasted that time. And there should be no more wasting of time, especially if you're somebody who calls yourself a believer, if you're somebody who's a follower of Jesus Christ. He says, wasting your time on idols or creating idols for yourself or wasting your, wasting your time on ideas of God that is not biblical in nature. He goes, that's what we used to do. God set us free. We don't have to do that no more. We don't have to waste that time. I don't know about you. I hate wasted time. I hate feeling like, man, the, the time just, you know, you ever get to an end of the day and you're like, man, I don't know what I accomplished today. I feel like I didn't get nothing done. How do you generally feel about those days? You feel great about them? Like, man, I can't wait to have some more days where I feel like I got nothing done. No, of course not. You're like, man, I got to put in some double time tomorrow. I hate wasted time. Secondly, he tells us that idolatry is dangerous. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14, God says, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. He doesn't say, hey, listen, you probably shouldn't mess around with that. You, you, you probably, you know, should try to avoid it. Like if you see it coming around the corner, like maybe just like try to go the other way. He says, if you see that thing coming, if you see idolatry creeping its ugly head in your life, you know what you do? Run. Run for your life. Run like, 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 like you, you're going to get caught and, and, and you're going to get in trouble. Like run like you, like you used to maybe run from your parent when you got in trouble for something and you didn't want to get spanked, right? Run like that. Run, run. Because what's coming for you is dangerous. Number three, he makes clear too, it's prolific. It's prolific. What do I mean by that? Look with me at verse 9. He says, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations, not because God just wants to punish the kids. What does he say? Of those who hate me. Where did those kids learn to hate God or not reverence God? From the parents, from the last generation. He says, watch this. If you let it creep into your life, maybe you'll be fine. Maybe that sin will kind of stay at bay and not affect you too much. Maybe you'll still be able to walk with me and it won't cause too many problems for you. But don't bank on it for the next generation. You read the stories of the kings. In fact, we remember this, guys. David, King David, he had a struggle, okay? And it's not a mystery. We read it in the scriptures, okay? King David liked the ladies, and the ladies got him into some trouble. But look what it did to his son Solomon. David was still able to maintain a relationship with the Lord. He was still able to walk with the Lord, and he repented when he sinned. But, but you look at what that did to Solomon. It tore the kingdom apart. It caused Solomon to, to wander and to, and to go into idolatry. And it wasn't until even the end of his life that he realized what he had been doing wrong, and he repented of it. And then he talks about how his life essentially was vanity. It was all in vain. And then you watch what it does to other generations after that. You watch what goes on with his next son, Rehoboam. You go, how does that happen? Because we didn't teach, we didn't warn them. Just like we said in the last point, that idolatry, that sin is dangerous. Speaking of a, re a revealing of character, my kids know in my household, I hate door slamming. All right? If I hear a door slam... It sends a chill up my spine. Even when I'm at other folks' house. I'm sorry if I go to your house and you're like, Ryan, why are you acting all nervous when the door slam? I hate door slamming for this very reason, okay? See that finger? There's one finger shorter than the other, all right? That's because of a door slamming. It sends a chill up my spine. It's a reminder. Every time I hear that door slam, it's like, oh, no, no, no. And I immediately ask the kids, I go, is everybody okay? Is everything okay? Why? Not because dad just hates the sound of doors closing, all right? No, it's because I remember the pain that it brought. I remember the marring. I remember the anguish. And I don't want that for my kids. You understand, God has an insight not only into our lives, but he also has an insight into the effect that sin will have in our lives. 
one that we don't always get. And he goes, listen, I, I, I'm trying to keep you in, in freedom. I'm trying to set you free. I'm, I'm trying to keep you in my liberty. I don't want you to become a slave to sin because sin is a horrible, horrible master to have in your life. It will leave you ravaged. It will leave you, leave you ruined. It will leave you living your life going, what was it for? It was a wasted life. It was a wasted time. And then it will have even more effect on your kids. And you remember in the 90s, the big thing was secondhand smoke. You remember that? First they tried telling people, hey, smoking ain't good for you. But then they started telling you, listen, not only is it not good for you, but guess who else it's not good for? All the kids in the household, right? People started finding out about the effects of secondhand smoke and how it could damage the children, that could damage, you know, other things. It, it, it could cause all sorts of problems, right? Then all of a sudden it became a much bigger issue. God is saying, please don't ever, ever think to yourself that your sin is your sin and your sin alone and it's only your problem. It is prolific. The Bible tells us time and time again that it gives birth to more sin. So it's like we talked about, well, we haven't talked about it yet, but we'll talk about this week, the sin of the, the leavening, right? How it expands. All right, number three, third commandment, verse 11 it says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Why would God say, I'm not going to hold you guiltless? Because oftentimes when we take the name of the Lord in vain, we think it's not a big deal. In fact, you look at the culture, you look at the, the, the way that the world lives, how they use the Lord and they use the things of the Lord. They talk about the Lord. They talk about the things of Christ. They talk about the church in a way that they think there won't be any repercussion for it. There won't be any answering. And the Bible, remember, tells us very clearly that every idle word will what? We'll have to give an account for, right? There's that area of Scripture in the Lord's Prayer that talks about hallowed be His name, right? And the idea is that we're to make it holy. We're to treat it reverently, right? The problem is, is that oftentimes, instead of hallowing His name, we make it hollow or empty. In fact, the word vain here means to treat as if it has no value, to treat it empty, to treat it as if it is empty, as, it, as if it makes no difference. When we talk about the things of the Lord, or we talk about Scripture, or we talk about God, or we talk about it in an empty way, it's much more than just adding adjectives and verbs to the name of the Lord and using it in a sentence. The Christian, if we're not careful, could be more guilty of, this of breaking this commandment than the person who uses obscenities with the name, with the name of the Lord. Because what he's saying is you treat it as if it has no value. You treat it as if it's just another word in your vocabulary. Like, oh, I'm going to talk about God. I'm going to talk about the Lord. And, 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 and what does that do to you? How does that impact your life? When you pray to God, when you speak his name and you talk to him, are you, are you doing so in a way that's reverent, that you understand, I am talking to the creator of all things. Are you in awe of the Lord? Are you in awe of his character? Or do you treat it as if, well, it can come, it can go? We must remember, God's not just some imaginary friend. He's not some person that's just occupying a chair. He's not just somebody in the room with us. He's the one that sustains us. You realize the Bible says that he holds all things together? That without the power of the Lord being exercised in our lives at this very moment, okay? There is nothing that would hold you together. All, all the atoms, all, all the things that you're made up of, they just disintegrate and fall apart. It is a sovereign act of God. And, and, and as such, He deserves, He is due the honor and the glory. Number four. He says in verse 12, Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. As the Lord your God commanded you, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. We're going to stop there for a quick second, and then we'll continue in this verse. But it's important to know that there are two things that are essentially conveyed in the giving of what we refer to as the fourth commandment, or the commandment to keep a Sabbath day. Number one is that God actually does care about work. 
Sometimes the focus is solely on the fact that, that God just wants us to take a rest. No, no, no. He's saying, listen, you make sure that you're active six days. Your days should be filled with work. All right? Your days should be filled with labor. Your days should be, and even if it's not a physical labor, there sh you should be doing something with the time that's been given to you. You're to be a good steward of those times, right? That's intrinsic in this commandment because he's saying, listen, you should work for six days. You should be active for six days. But then he goes on to say, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your, that your male servant... It, and your female servant may rest as well as you. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath. What God is saying here is that he wants everybody on their A game, and that means everybody needs to take a day of rest. Everyone. Know with me. He says you can't be clever here. Don't be cute. Don't think that, hey, I'm going to take a day of rest, but while I'm resting, I'm going to make sure that my workers or the people in my household, my kids, you know, I'm going to load them up with chores. I'm going to load them up with additional work to do. He says, no, no, no. You take a day of rest, and then you are responsible for making sure they take a day of rest. This is an important, important note for those that I believe own businesses or those that find themselves in a position of authority, God says very clearly here that it is our responsibility. To which some might reply, well, am I, am I my brother's keeper? And the answer is, you bet you are. He says, remember, and he specifically notates something that he doesn't say to them in the book of Exodus. He says to them, remember, you were slaves. Remember what it felt like? You remember how, how hard that was? You remember the idea, you remember laboring and laboring intensely and, and not finding any rest and finding yourself exhausted? He says, you make sure that you don't treat people like they're slaves. You make sure that you respect the fact that I have commanded them to keep the Sabbath just as much as I have done for you. And the idea is that they would even take it together and this is especially important for us, I think, as families, guys. It is important that we come together as a family and we, we, we remember, we hold to a day of rest. The idea of setting the day apart or making it holy, again, Jesus makes it clear that the, that the Sabbath was created for what? For man. It, it was for their benefit. God has some insight here. And God's insight is, is that, that, that nobody, no person, should be working to a point where they're, they're constantly going. I remember there was a season in my life where I decided, you know what, I'm going to work seven days a week. I had multiple jobs, all right? And it's like, man, I need to make money. I got I, I to I, I, I I pay the bills. And I understand for some people, that's a real struggle. The idea of, uh, I can't take a day off, because if I take a day off, then bills ain't getting paid. You know what I realized shortly after, after endeavoring into that, working seven days a week? It's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. It's almost as if God knows what he's talking about when he says, you need to take a day of rest. It's almost as if God knows what he's saying. How, it's almost as if he knows how he created us to not be able to just go and go and go and go and, and keep going. It's an unsustainable path. And he says it in a way that makes us not only consider ourselves, but also consider other people. What about here at church? What about here at work, or in our workplaces? I mean, it, you know, Pastor Ryan... And I know some pastors, and I'm being guilty of this myself, so allow me to also confess in the process. Guys, if you come and you serve at church, all right, and you're working at church, that's work. Even, even the Lord cited it as work, right? Because he talked about the priests, how they continue to labor inside the temple. But you know what? There needs to still be a day of rest. So if you come to church, all right, and you're serving, and you are actively serving in ministry, please, Take another day. 
Take another day. Take a day of rest because otherwise, you know what happens? You burn out. You burn out. And in the process of burning out, guess who gets misrepresented? Guess who, guess who looks like as if he hadn't considered it? It's the Lord. I, you, some of y'all know. And if you don't know, now I'm letting everybody know. Thursday. Thursday is my day of rest. That's for me and my family. I've had people call me up, and I don't respond to them, which is unusual for me. All right? I've had people text me. I've had people say, hey, can you come out and can you do this thing? Man, it's my day of rest. I've got to rest, because otherwise, come Sunday, I'll be no good to anybody, especially the Lord. He says, remember that you were slaves, and it wasn't good for you. Guys, remember this as well, please. Money, positions, power are never worth a relationship or a lost relationship with the Lord. It's never, in fact, God even says, what would it profit a man to gain the whole world and to suffer the loss of their soul? You know what? At the end of the day, something I've realized even more recently, it's not worth the loss of your family either. There's some things that you can go without. There's some things that you don't need as much of in your life. I don't need as much of in my life. It's not worth not being able to rest with your family, enjoy your family, be a good steward of the things that God's given to us. Colossians. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17 says this, So let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is Christ. Hebrews 4, 9 and 10 says, There remains therefore us a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his work as God did from his. In other words, if it's good for the Lord, we should take that as that's good for us too. What we think we might accomplish by continuing, by going without taking that time of rest, and forgive me if it feels like I'm just harping on this, we see examples of it in Scripture, what it costs the people. In fact, in 1 Samuel chapter 14, and I would encourage you to go there at another time, 1 Samuel chapter 14, verses 24 through 33, it tells us the story of Saul leading the army, okay, as they were going up against the Philistines. They're leading the army, all right, he's leading the army with his son Jonathan, and he makes this crazy decree, he goes, listen, nobody's going to rest, and nobody's going to eat until we beat these guys. He was task-oriented. He wanted to make sure that everything got done the way he wanted it to. And he says, nobody eats, nobody rests till we fight these guys and we beat them. He says, and if they do, they're going to be cursed and killed. Well, lo and behold, his son actually goes and grabs some honey because he didn't hear his dad's rule, all right? He eats some honey, and then they tell him, like, man, you shouldn't have done that. Your dad's going to be furious. And he goes, it's a crazy rule. Why would he ever do something like that? No, 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 it's your dad. You can't say something like that. No, 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 we, 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 we work hard, you know? In this country, I think we pride ourselves a little too much on that. We, we're hard workers. We're hard workers. We, we work really, really hard. We 50 hours a week, 60 hours a week, 70 hours a week. Got to make, you know, American dream. Got to build this thing, right? And here's what happens. The people finally do defeat the Philistines, and then God says, all right, or Saul, not God. Saul says, go ahead, eat. You know what they do? They take the cows right there on the spot, and they rip them open, and they start eating them with the blood and all. You know what the problem with that is? It was against the law of God. Because they created a law for themselves, or because Saul created a law for them that wasn't biblical in nature, He was the very cause and the reason why they sinned against the Lord. The Bible says that a man who pursues riches troubles his own household, his own home. He brings a curse upon them in that pursuit. Begs the question for some, so is is the Sabbath day and is Sunday the same thing? Is Sunday service and is Sabbath the same thing? Pastor Ryan, you're saying I'm supposed to take a day of rest, I'm supposed to take a Sabbath day, all right? So does that count as Sunday? Well, maybe. 
According to Mark chapter 16, verse 9, Acts chapter 20, verse 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, it actually gives us some insight into why the church typically met on the first day of the week. It was in remembrance of the Lord's day in which he resurrected. That was not the traditional Sabbath day for the Jews. The Sabbath day was the last day of the week, which would have been Saturday. And we also know that according to tradition and according to the very scriptures that we just covered, that, that they would typically meet on that day because most of them were what? Jews. So they would go and honor the Lord on the Sabbath day. They'd go to temple. They'd go to synagogue, right? They're honoring the Sabbath day. They're taking a day of rest. Then the first day of the week, they would go and meet, or I'm sorry, they would go and work. And then in the evening time, typically speaking, they would gather together for what we traditionally do on the mornings, which is have a service or a Sunday service, a day to remember the day of the Lord or the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So to answer that question plainly, or to answer that question simply, it's this. Is the Sabbath day and is Sunday the same day? It all depends on how you behave on that day. Are you resting? If you're not resting, and listen, it's okay. I work on Sundays. I do, right? We know that. So that's why I take Thursdays as well. That's why I make sure that I take a day of rest while still honoring the day of the Lord. Number five. Verse 16, honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you that your days may be long and that it may be well with you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. God is for families. The authority that he places upon the parents matters and they matter for functioning purposes, right? God developed the family and he gave the authority to the parents so that it might function correctly. Right? If you go to a restaurant, everybody is not in charge in the kitchen. Right? You've heard the old adage, you know, too many chefs spoil the what? Spoil the broth, right? Too many chefs in the kitchen. It's not a good thing. God is saying that in the structure of the family, he has set up authority, right? And it will go well with the children who respect and understand. He even says they'll live a long time. In fact, the Bible says that it's one of the first commandments with a promise, now, there's a practical reason why they would live a long time. Because in that time, disobedient to, disobedience to parents was a capital punishment. That means if you disobeyed, you dishonored your parents, you could die for it. You could be taken outside the camp and stoned to death. I'm watching all the kids in the room going, are you serious? Yeah. And here's why. Guys, I hope you hear the heart of the Lord here, but I hope you understand what I'm about to say. Some might consider that to be a barbaric and, a, and an ancient way of doing things, but God looks at it as being strategic. It would be better to sacrifice a single person than an entire generation who refused to respect the authority of the parents that God put in charge. We see that in our culture today. God says it would be better that one child dies for disobeying this commandment than watching an entire generation perish for all of eternity. And there is some, there's some even, and dare I say, it's, it's snobbish in nature. The parents that will turn their nose up at this idea, the idea of, of, of correcting children. The Bible says that, that those who love their children correct them. In fact, it's the very character that God displays towards us. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 12, he says, For whom the Lord loves, he corrects just as a father, the son in whom he delights. God says, Ryan, I love you so much that when you get out of line, I'm going to deal with you. And there are parents in our culture, sometimes even in our churches, praise God, I don't think it's this church, but who have this idea that disciplining their children is somehow this foolish and barbaric idea. Listen, better, better that your children cry now for a short time than they weep and gnash their teeth for all of eternity. Because that's what's on the line. God says it'd be better that they be stoned than that they would lead an entire generation and household to hell. 
Number six, you shall not murder. Quite plainly and basically, God is pro-life. He thinks that every person who bears his image, no matter the stage of life that they are in, are valuable. Every person. It is not about what stage of life they are in, but what image they bear. And the Bible makes it very clear that every one of us, every human being on this planet, bears the image of an eternal and awesome God. Now please don't confuse murder and killing. They're not the same thing. To murder means to take the life without cause of an innocent. All right? God is saying here that you will not take the life of somebody just because you don't like them. You will not take the life of somebody just because you have the authority and the power to. Please understand this. This was at a time where it was commonplace for kings and for rulers to kill people just because they didn't like the way that they looked. This was not unusual. If you, got in a, if, if you rubbed the king the wrong way, that's it. You're out of here. God holds every single person, no matter their power, no matter their authority, no matter the worth that this world places upon them, God says every single life matters to him. He cares deeply about them because they bear the image of an awesome and mighty God. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. God wants us to present a clear picture in the marriage covenant. Please understand, the Bible says, according to Ephesians, that the reason why God gave us a marriage covenant is that we might be able to present, I don't know what that is, but we might be able to present, guys, a clear picture of the gospel message. You realize that's what your marriage was designed for? Think about this for a second. God says, I didn't let you get married just because I thought that it would be really cool for the two of you to get to know each other and spend some time together. No, no, he says, the reason why I put you together, the reason why I brought a union between the two people, a husband and their wife, is that they might be able to clearly portray the gospel message through their relationship. Jesus makes it clear that a husband is to love his wife as Christ loves the church and gave himself for her. And when we mar that marriage covenant by acting in a manner that is adulterous in nature, what we do is we make that picture muddy. Biblical institutions, as we said before, are not arbitrary, but they are purposeful. Ignoring, blurring, redefining only muddies the message that they were meant to give. You go, man, next time you think about a relationship. Next time you think about wandering outside the marriage relationship, God says, please, I want you to understand that what you might be doing is you might be misrepresenting the gospel to people around you. Number eight, you shall not steal. God says, he gives generously. And therefore, as his creation, who has been given so much from a generous God, he doesn't want us to undermine that generosity by pretending it wasn't enough and taking something that doesn't belong to us. Think about that. Yeah, you might say, well, you know, listen, this isn't really my struggle. I don't really struggle with stealing. I'm pretty good. But maybe we can steal from God or we can steal in other ways. The test, please understand this, is not what we necessarily do with others, but how we treat and how we respond to what we've already been given. God's given us time. What are we doing with it? God's given us opportunity. What are we doing with it? God's given us great resources and great riches. What are we doing with them? Are we robbing from God? Are we stealing from God glory, honor, time? 1 Chronicles 16.21, God says, Give to the Lord, give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of of holiness. What about our resources? What about our resources and the money that God has entrusted to us? According to Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10, God says, will a man rob God? Now think about that. How many of you guys have ever
thought to yourselves, I just ripped God off. Most of us don't think that way, right? The idea of stealing from God, right, especially if you consider it to be awesome and powerful and holy, right, none of us would dare venture into it. It's like, no, 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 I would never go into God's house and steal anything that doesn't belong to me, right? But God says the reality is that nothing belongs to us. And so when he says, will a man rob God, he goes on, he says, yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you, right? I don't remember doing that. I don't remember breaking in. I don't remember taking something that doesn't belong to me. He says, in tithes and offerings, you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now this day, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven, and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. God says, you want to know how you've robbed me? By not acknowledging through your tithes and offerings that I was the one that gave you everything to begin with. You've robbed me the glory, you've robbed me the honor, and you've robbed from me in that you don't recognize that that you had nothing. And and when I ask you to, to be obedient by serving me in this area, you don't. Man, I I never looked at it that way, Lord. You see, it's easy for us to look and go, I don't don't steal, I'm not a thief, right? But then when God brings it into light, how it is that we do rob him in other areas of our lives, again, and maybe tithing ain't a big deal for you, and it's like, man, I don't don't struggle with that. But for me, it could be remembering to give God the glory that he's due, remembering to use my, my, my time as a good steward, we look foolish in the process. I remember I, I did steal one time, guys. There's one time in my life that I go, I definitely stole, and I definitely got busted for it, all right? I remember how ridiculous I looked. First time I ever stole anything. I'm going by this little candy store. It was, at the, it was in this place called the Coral Springs Mall, all right? Some of y'all have been there. You know what I'm talking about. It was a Coral Springs Mall. Now it's a school, all right? But there was a candy store right in the middle of the mall. It had two openings, one on each side, right? And I used to go there, hang out, I'd go, go to a movie. There was an arcade there, too. I went into the candy store, all right? I just wanted to steal something. I felt, I felt like, man, I need to accomplish something today by stealing something. I'm going to steal me some candy, and I'm going to grab it, and I'm going to run, and nobody's going to catch me, right? All right, so I go in there, and the first candy bucket that I come to, okay, was the giant, like, giant jawbreakers. They were like this big. It's the first thing that I grab. So I reach into the bucket, I grab the jawbreaker, and I start running, all right? And, and then I hear, hey, stop, all right? But I keep running. I'm not going to stop. I learned that lesson. You don't stop when they tell you stop, all right? So I keep running, all right? But then I look back and I realize, I'm not faster than the person that's chasing me, all right? Which is a problem if you're going to steal something, right? So I, I, I then I scramble for an idea, and the only thing that comes to mind is get rid of the evidence, right? If they catch me, but I don't have any evidence, and they say, you stole something, I'm going to hit them with, well, prove it, right? So there's a big open area. I can't throw it. There's no trash can. All right? There's only one place for this jawbreaker to go that's this big. And I go, Whoop. and then I stop, and the guy goes, did you steal something from my store? Did you steal a jawbreaker? And I go, Whoop. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Like, Ryan, you look so foolish. We look foolish when we rob God, and then God calls us out, and we go, no, no, no. No, 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 it doesn't mean that. And I've talked to some people, especially when it comes to giving, they'll be like, oh, no, it doesn't mean that anymore. You know, God actually in the New Testament doesn't say that you're supposed to tithe. Actually, Jesus specifically says, these things you ought to do without leaving the others undone. And every example that we find in the New Testament of people giving is more than 10%. You will not find a single example of somebody giving less. So you go, wait a second, when we try to argue or out-argue or out-maneuver God, not just in this command, but in anyone, we look just like I do. 
trying to hide the evidence, but looking foolish in the process. God's calling us out saying, hey, listen, I'm trying to set you free. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to pour out more blessings into your life than you know what to do with. And you're holding on to the goofy jawbreaker here. Why? Number nine. We're going to finish the Ten Commandments. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Gray doesn't exist for God. God loves true and false statements. In other words, God is big on things either being true or not true. Nowhere in the scriptures do you go, well, sometimes that's true. That's kind of true. God says, no, no, no. Statements that are made, things that are said, are either true or false in nature. A little bit, a little bit of a lie poisons any truth. If I were to hand somebody a cup of water, I take a dropper with arsenic in it, and I put one drop in there, and I said, drink up. You would look at me and go, no, I'm good. I'm good. I don't want to die. There's poison in that. And I would go, but most of it is water. Don't worry about it. There's one drop of poison in the whole thing. You go, that's ridiculous. So too is it ridiculous to argue with the Lord or to argue against the Lord when we come up with things or ideas like half-truths, white lies, hidden details, hidden agendas, slander, or even sometimes just being quiet when we know something is wrong and we ought not to be. God says, that's still bearing false witness. That's still lying. I don't care how you dress it up. I don't care what kind of wrapping that you put on it. It's lying. The Bible tells us in John 8, 44, you know who the author or the father of all lies is? Satan. Lying is is satanic in nature. Colossians 3, 9 says, do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. Sometimes it's hard. You know, sometimes it's really, really difficult. Sometimes it's just better to say to say to somebody, don't ask me that question if you don't want the truth, right? God's saying, listen, do not lie. That's the way that the old man used to do things. That's the way, that's the way that the, the old master used to have you do things. You don't lie anymore. You treasure truth. The Bible says that there is no lie in God, that he is the author of truth. He's not a man like us that he can lie. He won't lie. It's not in his nature. And finally, number 10. You shall, I'm sorry, number 10. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, his male servant, his female, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. I love how the Lord starts off with a spouse. You know what that means? Guys, gals. Don't ever buy into that lie. If you were just like so-and-so, if you were more like so-and-so, you realize that God is doing away with that whole idea, that whole thought process. We should never compare. We should never try to, to try to possess something that God hasn't given to us. He's given all things perfectly. He didn't make a mistake when he allotted to us anything that we possess or anything that we don't possess in this life. If we believe that God is truly sovereign, right, and we believe that he has given to us more than what we ever deserved in this life, then whatever we have, we should be like, praise God, I didn't deserve any of it, and I got something. You know? It's like, it's like when my kids ask for a dessert, right? And I go, you know, sure, you can have a dessert, you can have a cookie. And they're like, but I wanted ice cream. You wanted What? You didn't have any dessert a minute ago, and now you're going to specify what it is that you want? Now you know what you get? Or it goes, zip. Now you got nothing. It's interesting, the word covet, you know what it means in the original language? To pant after. You know what immediately comes to my mind? You remember those old cartoons with the, with the, with the dogs, right? They'd see something they like, and the tongue would come out. <sighs> It's exactly what he's saying. He says, that's what you look like when you covet something in your heart, right? Even if you don't exercise that thought out loud, even if it doesn't materialize into words, what God's seeing is a dog panting after something. I just want, I just got to have it. It'd be so much better if I had, if I had that spouse, if I had that servant, if I had that car, if I had that thing. 
He goes, you look ridiculous, man. Now you guys will never forget not to covet. Praise God. <laughs> Luke chapter 12, verse 15, he says, and he said to them, watch this, think coveting is no big deal. Like, we make, I love this, we put special emphasis on certain commandments, right? Like, if I were to walk out and say, hey, what commandments do you think you probably won't do, and there's good reason not to do them, most of us would be like, no adultery, because I'll die, all right? No, no murdering, because I don't want to go to jail, right? It's like we go to those immediately. This is what Jesus said. Please note this. Jesus said, and take, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. God says, you be very careful of this thing called covetousness. You take heed. You beware. It's creeping its ugly head around. Okay, It will cause you to fall into other sins is the, is the idea. Covetousness is the root for all the other things we just looked at, if you will. You steal, why? Because you wanted something that didn't belong to you. You commit adultery, why? Because what you had wasn't good enough, right? You kill because you feel like you deserve to be, you deserve to be respected, or you, deserve, you feel like you've been wronged, and you deserve that respect, you deserve that fear, whatever it is. Says so this sin will lead to all sorts of problems. Don't worry about what you possess. Rather, be concerned with who possesses you. We got God. Is that enough? Hebrews 13.5, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Think about what he just said there. He says, don't covet after anything. Be happy with what you got. And guess what you got? The one who will never leave you nor forsake you. He doesn't mention anything else to him. He doesn't mention you got this in your life, you got this house, you got cars, you got kids, you got... He says, you got God. Is that good enough? I want it to be good enough for me. I want to make sure that I don't allow covetousness to rear its ugly head. And guys, I want in the process to understand that this is the character of God, and this is a God who desires not to restrict or restrain me in my life, but to set me free. That's the God that I got in my life. That's the God that you got in your life. And that's a good thing to have.